Olá, you're tuned in to Rádio Vive Agora, I'm Matheus Potumati, and we're together on a scientific journey towards living better. Hey everyone, before we carry on with today's episode, just a quick disclaimer in Portuguese. Pessoal, essa entrevista foi gravada em inglês e por isso como você está vendo eu decidi fazer a intro também em inglês. É, dessa forma, se alguma pessoa que não fala a língua de Camões por acaso se deparar com este conteúdo nas ondas da internet, quem sabe, talvez consiga entender aí alguma coisa. É, Para ajudar na sua compreensão, a versão do YouTube tem legendas em português que você pode ativar quando quiser e o programa em áudio também vai ter uma versão dublada. Além disso, a gente vai publicar a transcrição completa da entrevista para você consultar quando quiser, tirar alguma dúvida e coisa do tipo, ok? Então, de volta aí ao idioma do nosso entrevistado. This episode is a masterclass on all things fasting, calorie restriction and ketogenic diet and the relation between the three and longevity. Since 2019, fasting has been the most searched diet-related term in the world meaning that, of course, uh, there is a great interest in the subject, but also a lot of noise about it. So to clarify what are the benefits, if any, of fasting, CR and keto, who should reap the most benefits from them, which is best for you, and how to apply them into your lifestyle if you want to, we reached out to one of the world's leading experts on the subject. You hear more about him in a while, so for now suffice to say that Mr. James Clement is a dedicated researcher and a very, very generous soul who gave us over eight hours of his time, almost four of which have been recorded, yielding in two episodes that I hope you enjoy greatly. He spoke to us from his laboratory in Florida and chose not to record video so he could take a walk outside as he talked, a very nice habit, if I may say. Uh, the interview was recorded in January of 2021, but we delayed the release of, of the interview to coincide with the release of his book, The Switch, which was launched in Brazil in late April by Editora Globo, with the title Vire a Chave, Perca Peso, Previna Doenças, Aumente Sua Disposição e Viva Mais. It's a fantastic reading, uh, which combines strong scientific research with very accessible writing, uh, a suitable combination for a scientist who's dedicated to popularizing cutting-edge research with you and me for free. Before we jump into the interview, just a reminder for you to subscribe to the radio on YouTube or on your podcast service of choice and also to check us out on social media under at Somos Vive Agora. Again, at Somos Vive Agora. Lastly, it's fair to point out that English is not my first language, and this being my first interview in English, I count on your generosity with my eventual stammering or lack of fluency here and there. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy my conversation with my friend, Mr. James Clement. Our guest today is a scientist with a quite unique journey. He runs one of the world's leading labs uh, dedicated to the anti-aging research. But prior to that, he used to be a tax lawyer and a microbrewer. About uh, 12 years ago, he quit a very comfortable career to commit his life to science through his organization, Better Humans, and in fact, to make the lives of many humans better with it. Over the last three decades, Mr. James W. Clement has been leading world-renowned projects like the Supercentenarians Research Study, which was featured in a New York Times Science article in 2017, along with conducting humans' anti-aging clinical trials and publishing a number of peer-reviewed articles on the world's top scientific journals. He uh, summarized some of his most important uh, anti-aging findings on a book he released on New Year's Eve 2019 called The Switch, Ignite Your Metabolism with Intermittent Fasting, Protein Cycling and Keto, as in ketogenic diet. Uh, the book just got translated into Portuguese and is set to be released or was released depending on when you're listening to this episode in Brazil through Editora Globo. Today, Mr. Clement 
Uh, is that right, James Clement? Right? Yeah, got that. Yes. Fair enough. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay, like like your family in the Midwest would would say. Um, joins us from his laboratory property. He's uh, originally from the Midwest, but now he's currently living in Gainesville, Florida, which is a city in, uh, a city in countryside Florida, uh, to share some of his inspiring biography and to dive deep into all things autophagy, fasting, caloric restriction, life extension, transhumanism, and whatever else time allows. So, uh, James, welcome to the show. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you, Medio. That was a really flattering introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm really thrilled about the book being translated into Portuguese and um, uh, conveying this knowledge, which I think is really important uh, to another group of people. So uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's... It's going to be really exciting to be able uh, to, to, to talk about your book and your, your research. Before we get to, to your research, um, I guess like uh, some people would expect a person who makes craft beer to have some intimacy with chemistry, but uh, mostly everyone gets pretty puzzled uh, when they found, find out that a lawyer can actually become a scientist. So uh, your life story is really unique and inspiring and flat out amazing. So uh, for starters, man, uh, tell us, how did it all get you this? Uh, well, uh, I guess I'm a bit of an odd duck. The, uh, the era I grew up in, in the uh, 1960s, I was born in 55, and um, uh, I remember all of the Gemini, Mercury, Apollo launches. Um, of course, I was a teenager, uh, early teenager, when um, we stepped foot on the moon. I was a space nut and really devoted to um, science in general. Um, but at the same time, we were having uh, tremendous political upheaval back then. You know, the war in Vietnam went on for 10 yeah. years while I was growing up. Um, then Nixon became president. We had Watergate and all this. And I kind of got talked into by my um, college professors of going into law. And um, I changed had the world. Had an, well, pretty much, uh, you know, kind of had this humanitarian bent uh, to, you know, what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. um, uh I really didn't know anything about um, the field of biogerontology, the, the study of the biology of aging, until I came across a book in my third year of law school called Life Extension, a Practical Scientific Approach by uh, uh, two scientists, uh, Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw. And that book really kind of changed my life and set my own personal direction both in terms of what I was going to do with my personal lifestyle and my my aspirational goals of um, adding to that research. Um, and I just didn't get to a point where I could um, follow through with that desire until the early 2000s. I uh, turned 50 and my parents were, you know, turning in, into their 70s. and um, you know, people that I knew were having health problems. So I really decided that I would start attending conferences and um, going to medical conferences and, and doing as much reading as possible. And then fortuitously, um, I got onto the board of Gnome, the first uh, direct-to-consumer genetics company that George Church had co-founded. George is... Yeah. Uh, one of the top one or two genetic scientists in um, America, and he heads the genetics department at Harvard Medical School. And yeah. when I had my whole genome sequenced in 2009, I, um, I had George was the person who read my genomic interpretation oh. to me. Mm -hmm. So that sort of started a relationship that um, I was able to talk to George about my interest in longevity 
And as a result, I started this supercentenarian research study uh, in uh, 2010. And uh, I worked with, uh, with George um, fairly closely for about five or six years, um, traveled around the, the world, meeting people who were uh, 106 years of age and older. And eventually I collected about um, 60 different blood samples from those people, their relatives. Uh, and in 2017, George and I got all of those um, uh, DNA samples, whole genome sequenced, and we put um, all of those genomes available online so that researchers around the world could have access to these 60 um, supercentenarian uh, genomes for their research for free. No royalties, no licenses, just write to us and ask for permission to get access to the, to the genomes. Um, right. And about, um, about that time, I started segueing into some clinical trials, um, first doing mouse research, which I, I moved from the Bay Area, where I had been living from about 2007 on, to mm -hmm. Los Angeles, and um, set up a mouse lab. And I was really interested in stem cell transplantation between um, uh, baby mice and older mice. And what they've consistently found is that the older mouse gets younger and rejuvenated, and the young mouse gets their age accelerated. So it's actually kind of bad for the young mice. Um, that led me to looking at what would be the next step in this to doing clinical trials. And um, I ended up launching my first clinical trial, human interventional clinical trial in 2016. And from there, we started doing other IRB approved clinical trials. And um, eventually, um, I decided that we needed a larger population base. So I moved to Florida, set up a, a, a large lab here with the help of uh, some really great donors um, uh, who were interested in my research. And um, last summer, we rented an office uh, to conduct human anti-aging clinical trials from in a place called the Villages in Florida, which is basically a retirement community of about 135,000 senior citizens. So it's a really great location for us to be in the middle of this large body of, of senior citizens and to be able to uh, invite them for free because you know we're a nonprofit, we don't charge anything to participate in clinical trials. Um, to be part of this anti-aging revolution. Your story uh, re resembles some of, uh, of, of the internet pioneers, like, uh, I, I mean, like the uh, making a comparison between what you're doing in gerontology uh, with the internet pioneers like Tim Berners-Lee, Jimmy Wales, and the late uh, Aaron Swartz, people who try to fight the good fight. So um, you're actually making less money than you were doing, but just uh, trying to, to get knowledge to the world and to be as democratic as possible. That is the, the strategy I've been following. I, I'm personally much more oriented towards um, the humanitarian aspect of medicine and, in this mm -hmm. case, uh, providing anti-aging therapies to the masses. Um, yeah. You know, I grew up in a very um, modest, uh, you know, economic uh, situation, and I, I certainly could not see my uncles and aunts and grandparents affording some of the therapies that would be offered um, in this yeah. field. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's, you know, I, I don't personally think that it's fair that you can allow people to uh, get old and suffer uh, from many um, morbidities and um, not present them with the option of um, 
availability of, of a therapy that would alleviate that suffering, allow them to um, experience life as, as they possibly had when they were much younger, and you know, to, to go back to enjoying life. So um, I, I'm, I'm very much committed to um, approaching this scientifically, at least as a nonprofit. If, uh, if, we, if we develop something that does not have a particular acute uh, anti-aging um, therapeutic value, um, if it's just something that's sort of a side note, then I, I've got friends who are venture capitalists that, you know, I, I could point to and say, why don't you take this and put together a team and run with it and, you know, make it into right. a product or, or whatever you want. But that's not, I don't want to do that. I've, I've been an entrepreneur. I ran microbreweries. I was in um, a high tech oil and gas exploration business for a while. And, um, you know, done many things that um, were profit oriented. I really enjoy it, and I think it's a it, it's a it's an incredible uh, process that um, you know people should experience. Uh, but I just feel a little differently about anti aging and medicine in general mm -hmm. uh, because human suffering is you know yeah. so deeply wrapped into that that I would rather uh, be able to be free to collaborate with uh, colleagues and, and uh, 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 friends that, that are also in the same field and not constantly be having to say, well, I'm sorry, I can't talk about that because, you know, we're, we're working on our intellectual property protection or, yeah. you know, we're not at the stage yet, you know, like we're trying to get funding and we don't want somebody to scoop us with the VCs, you know, take our idea and run with it, uh, et cetera. And, and I do find that going on in the field quite a lot where, um, you know, many of my good friends just really can't talk about their work. And um, I, I'm- Yeah, yeah, NDAs more, and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm, I'm just much more interested in collaborating and trying to get this, um, into the public realm as quickly as yeah. possible. And I think having done the cl clinical trials has um, really um, exacerbated that, that situation that, you know, I see these patients and I see what our um, therapies, um, which again, you know, we didn't invent these therapies. Um, they were done by, you know, great scientists at other places. Um, but in, in some cases, I think we were the first to do um, like a senolytics uh, study with the yeah. compounds to satinib and quercetin. It was a year long uh, clinical trial um, approved by an IRB committee and um, uh, focused on people yeah. with osteoarthritis. And we had a couple patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And to see how, how it positively affected these patients was really gratifying, but also, um, you know, just really drilled into me how urgently this is needed. And, and, you know, you don't want to wait 10 or 15 years for somebody to raise the money, do the testing, and um, go into a huge clinical trial uh, for a product if there's a way to do it with existing uh, approved FDA drugs and to um, um, speed that process up, you know, um, scale you up know, to, and make, make it yeah, available to, to, a, to everyone. Yeah, exactly. And so I tend to focus on things that can be scaled up as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, novel compounds or something that would require, uh, you know, a new drug indication or um, mm -hmm. a long uh, FDA clinical trial approvals. That is truly fantastic. And uh, we, we thank you for that. Like uh, it's really uh, fundamental that someone is uh, undertaking the, that kind of work. Uh, so uh, stepping into your research now and especially your book, James. Um, so your book is named The Switch. Uh, we don't know yet the, how it's gonna be translated into Portuguese. But 
what is uh, the switch and why should we care about it? Uh, well, let me give you a little background information. So um, this was one of those early um, time periods around 2013 when um, uh, there was a, um, uh, a, a bump in my uh, funding where um, it didn't make sense to um, um, spend all of my time trying to raise more money uh, for the laboratory as opposed to spending the time doing some research. And I had a very particular uh, project that I wanted to look into, um, which is um, this correlation between calorie restriction, fasting of different types, and the ketogenic diet. Right. Um, so in early 2013, uh, my roommate at the time um, started a ketogenic diet. I looked into the medical research uh, surrounding it, and um, it, it it has some really promising neurological benefits. And um, there were sort of hints of um, blood parameters and things like that that improved on the diet as well. And what I couldn't find was any kind of association with these other longevity practices. And I, at least in those days, couldn't find articles that talked about the similarities between intermittent fasting and calorie restriction in terms of um, right. are these additive? Like, can you go on a, a 30 percent calorie restriction diet and then occasionally right. fast? Like, will the fasting mm -hmm. add to your longevity and your health benefits or are, do they cancel each other out in the sense that if you're doing one, adding the other one's not going to increase your health span or, or lifespan? Uh, and the same with the uh, ketogenic diet. So I, I right. did this massive dive into uh, mm -hmm. papers, starting with um, calorie restriction and then working my way through all of those and the intermittent fasting and the ketogenic papers. And um, uh, as I've put in the book, about 500 papers into this, I kind of had an aha moment going through my notes that mm -hmm. all of these things were related in one pathway involving right. something called mTOR and what happened when mTOR got turned down and that was to turn on this very advantageous intracellular process called autophagy and so um i i next set out to try and read as many papers as I could to nullify that hypothesis, meaning to disprove to myself that that yeah. was true. Mm -hmm. And that's how science ha science happens. How real science happens. You have a hypothesis and try to disprove it, right? Exactly. So so um, about six months into this, I'd read about a thousand papers, and I had I prepared a PowerPoint. I uh, I contacted George Church, my mentor at Harvard uh, Medical School, and um, David Sinclair, another um, really yeah. fantastic anti-aging scientist yeah. uh, at Harvard Medical School, also in the genetics department. Um, and I asked them if I could make a presentation about these ideas because I couldn't find anywhere where someone had put these, connected these dots and laid them all right. out and said, look, all this genetic information that we know about anti-aging, all the drugs that um, that we see as being um, strong um, rejuvenation and anti-aging drugs, they're all centered around this one um, pathway. So I I had this meeting in December of 2013. Um, I, I asked them, you know, first of all, did they agree, which they did. Uh, and then secondly, like if I were to try and link these dots together more significantly and, and really prove that this is this is the case, uh, what kind of experiments should I do? And um, and it was really David who said, I think you've got a lot here that already proves what you're saying. 
you should write this up in a book. And, uh, and so I went away and read another thousand papers in the field and really started drilling down in some of the areas that I thought were important. And one of the things I, I was really kind of amazed with, um, because lots of times there's things that just sound great in mice. And then when you try and translate it over to humans, uh, just doesn't work. And, you know, that could partially be because um, humans already live, you know, 80, 90, 100 years. Mice only live, you know, two to three years. So maybe we're yeah. already, by, by evolution, optimized in the one way that we were able to get mice to live slightly longer. So when you take that therapy and give it to a human, it doesn't affect us because we've already we've already sort of incorporated that. So, mm -hmm. so I was, uh, I was really impressed that I, for almost all of these ideas, I could find a group um, that exists and had, you know, been in existence uh, in some cases for a thousand years or more, uh, applying aspects of, you know, these ideas for um, uh, turning on the switch. Uh, turning on autophagy and and suppressing uh, mTOR, and just as you would expect, these groups were known for great health and longevity. So, rather than saying um, this sounds like a great idea, but we're going to have to do years worth of clinical trials, I was able to find groups that were already doing these yeah. things. Mm -hmm. People, you know, mm -hmm. people who were fasting, people who were doing calorie restriction. So just to, clar to clarify here, um, uh, we're talking about some some concepts that uh, some people might not uh, fully understand. So could you briefly describe what is mTOR and how autophagy works? Sure. Um, so uh, mTOR was discovered as a result of a chemical uh actually a a um chemical signal given off back by bacteria from Bacteria. Rapa Nui, uh, Easter Island um that kills fungus so the the chemical eventually became rapamycin and the uh the complex inside the cell that it targeted became known as tor target of rapamycin t o r and then um, that was essentially in yeast. And, and as they found that it was also, um, that complex was also in mammalian cells, they changed the name to mammalian target of rapamycin mTOR. And then eventually, because they found out it was basically ubiquitous in, in almost all living organisms, they just changed it to mechanistic target of rapamycin. So um, this, this complex is inside the cells. It, it has um, means by which it senses uh, oxygen levels, uh, the availability of certain building block proteins, and um, glucose, which is the, one of the primary energy uh, sources um, of the cell, right. to basically tell it, is it okay to make proteins or to divide and double. So cellular growth is basically determined by what mTOR cell tells the cell to do. If the energy level of the cell drops too low, which is um, uh, the ATP level of the cell, then it'll, it'll essentially throw a switch that tells mTOR to downregulate and not to go through a cell division or to start producing a bunch of, of proteins. So um, these mechanisms are inside our cells, uh, and when mTOR is turned down, another process um, starts, which was essentially evolved, uh, we believe, to give more energy and proteins, et cetera, to the cell so that it could go ahead and replicate and make these necessary proteins. And that process was called autophagy. And what it does basically is to take existing uh, bad proteins, that is misfolded, 
um, glycated uh, proteins and glycated and dysfunctional etc mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to essentially sweep them up and take them to this recycle center uh, inside the cell called the lysosome where uh, acidic enzymes basically break them down so that they can be reused and uh, mm -hmm. toxins uh, other things that can't be used are simply um, uh, taken out of the cell as waste. The interesting thing that I realized right away was that the signaling that tells mTOR whether or not it should be turned up and essentially making more cells and making more proteins versus doing this housekeeping function of turning on autophagy uh, was almost always in one direction in in modern life and that's toward the cell building yeah mm -hmm. and um i could easily see where many people could probably go decades and decades without ever having autophagy turned on uh, let, let's just take a pause just summarize it a little bit here for for the listeners so like mTOR is like a pathway or an enzyme that signals tissues and cells to to grow and uh, this is why uh, when when you your muscle is growing, when your bones are growing, it's mTOR which is uh, uh, telling uh, your body to grow. But it needs to be turned down too. So this is the switch. Uh, when it turns, uh, it's turned down. Uh, it, it triggers another mechanism, which is autophagy, which is uh, necessary for recycling, for building up of of new. Uh, new cells and, and stuff and to flush out toxins and such. So uh, in a healthy environment, we would uh, regularly need to mTOR to be up and down. So up to uh, signal growth and down to signal autophagy and recycling. But then as you were pointing out, uh, for uh, most, uh, sub, sub, most of our recent uh, history, We've been only on the on switch, right, for mTOR. That's it's a great summary. Uh, and one of the things that um, I really wanted to stress in the book, we evolved for mTOR to be turned on part of the time and autophagy to be turned on part of the time. And even though this sounds like a really great thing, let's clear let's clear out all the the bad things that are inside the cell. If you say that you're never going to build cells and you're never going to yeah. uh, make proteins, you keep that uh, turned down um, more so than necessary. And so, you know, this can't be a uh, one-way switch. That's going to be just as bad in the long run as yeah. um, going the other direction and saying, I'm never going to clean the house. You know, I'm just going to double double the size of my organs and, and, you know, reproduce all my cells and make lots of proteins without ever fixing the problems. Bodybuilders have really um, taken this kind of to the extreme and um, uh, have focused on, you know, how do you get uh, mTOR at its highest level? Because, you know, they want a lot of uh, muscles and that requires uh, mTOR to be uh, upregulated um, uh, quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So what we find is that the amino acids that that help turn on mTOR are largely found in these branch chain amino acids. mTOR has um, numerous sensors, one of which is for particularly activated by a couple of branch chain amino acids, leucine and isoleucine and valine. And leucine is uh, very prevalent in meat, um, condensed milk, which is essentially what cheese is, uh, it's very high in leucine. Uh, ways um, that uh, bodybuilders uh, drink um, is loaded with leucine, and you can even just buy supplements of uh, branch chain amino acids. So this will upregulate mTOR quite a quite a lot, and um, it makes total sense that uh, these branch chain amino acids would be in milk because 
let's say you have a, uh, a mother cow that has a calf, um, evolution wants that calf to be able to grow as quickly as possible so that it can stay up with the herd and not get eaten by predators. So, and uh, you still need um, oxygen and you still need um, this hormone called IGF-1, um, which is generally present when insulin is in the bloodstream. So if you have insulin and the body is in this growth mode and uh, growth hormone has been um, released by the pituitary gland, uh, the liver will make IGF-1 uh, basically to tell cells that it's, um, it's a good time to, to grow. And uh, if these other conditions um, like oxygen and, and glucose are available, then it, it has everything it needs um, uh, for making cells and for making um, proteins. Um, mm -hmm. On the autophagy side, Basically, what you have to do is short circuit one of those things that mTOR needs. And the easiest one to short circuit is uh, glucose. So if you deplete your body of its glucogen stores, uh, and in the book I talk about, you know, 150 pound person and how much energy they store um, as blood sugar and in their yeah. muscles where it's stored as glucogen and in their liver. Um, and it's, it's generally only about 16 to eight hours worth of energy. Um, so if you stop consuming uh, carbohydrates, which can um, you know, be broken down into glucose and limit your protein, which, which through another process can also be turned into glucose in the liver, then you simply run out of of um, of glycogen, and yeah. your insulin levels will drop. The IGF one won't be made in the liver, and so that signal won't be received by mTOR, and it'll simply halt it. So mm -hmm. this is how fasting, the ketogenic diet, and calorie restriction all work: is essentially by cutting back those signals that would otherwise tell mTOR to go ahead and make lots of cells and, and proteins. So any, any way that you can uh, deplete your glycogen stores, whether it's uh, through caloric restriction, uh, fasting, or also exercising a lot, exactly. is going to trigger uh, your mTOR to trigger autophagy. It's going to hunker down the system and say, guys, now it's time to take care of... Uh, of the trash and to recycle. People are uh, very impacted by, by uh, fasting and caloric restriction nowadays. And uh, I guess most, most people don't know exactly how it works, why it works like that. So it's important to, to point that out. But uh, in actually, uh, we've been studying a lot of, of, of this uh, therapies, uh, strategies uh, over the last years, but it's been studied um, regularly for almost a century now. Uh, you're who are on the, the very um, edge of, of research on that field. What does the, the latest research say, say about, about fasting and, and CR, and why should anyone fast then? Uh, so there's, there's two main benefits. Um, one of the first things that I think is really important for people to look at is their own uh, BMI, body mass index, um, mm -hmm. because there's um, just tremendous uh, studies, number of studies that show this association between being obese and having uh, much higher all-cause mortality, uh, death and um, the arise of uh, comorbidities. So, you know, people have heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and things like that uh, much more uh, frequently if they're obese than not. Um, so one aspect, which I think is important, is that calorie restriction, fasting, and the ketogenic diet can be used very successfully to lose weight. And I've mm -hmm. 
I've had a number of friends come to me and, and ask what's the best way of getting into fasting so that they can lose weight. And um, I, I've advised them um, primarily to start with a ketogenic diet. Because for most people that follow just a normal uh, Western style diet, uh, which includes a lot of um, the branch chain amino acids that we were talking about. So, you know, they consume dairy products, they have lots of uh, carbohydrates, so their glucose levels are always full, and their mTOR has been turned on uh, pretty much continuously for most of their adult life. Um, what you find is that their cells struggle to switch from burning glucose to burning fat. And if you right. don't ever burn fat, then it's really hard to get rid of the fat. Um, so your body just wants to store because we evolved not to have all of these um, uh, fast foods, carbohydrates, and, and um, dairy products available to us. These are really uh, fairly recent in the evolution of humans. What you uh, essentially want is to practice a lifestyle that's a little more in keeping with how we evolved. What, what people doesn't uh, often realize is that this uh, availability of uh, calories that, that we experience uh, now uh, wasn't a, a, a rule uh, up until, I don't know, say seven, 7,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, right? Uh, prior to that, have been millions of years uh, under periods of, of starvation and uh, a lot of uh, food availability. Uh, so our, our metabolism hasn't evolved to cope with that uh, amount of caloric intake that we have right now. That's true, but I, I go into this in a lot more detail in the book because uh, what I want to show people is that even though agriculture is said to have started eight to eight to nine thousand years ago, it was actually geographically pretty isolated. And right. um, uh, for example, hunter gatherers um, did did not switch over to agriculture as the primary societal means of of gaining food in places like Northern Europe um, yeah. uh, and Scotland until uh, around the Uh, around the, the turn of the millennium in, uh, from B.C. to A.C. And of course, if you look at, at the consumption of certain very highly refined carbohydrates, which I think cause the most problem in uh, the human diet, uh, that's really changed dramatically just in the past hundred years. Just a hundred years ago, the average American, let's say, ate about 15 pounds of sugar a year. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. But, but just 100 years later, each person was eating an average of 150 pounds uh, a year. And um, in addition to this um, overconsumption of sugar and flour, um, we've also... Um, Uh, really dramatically increase the amount of fat that, that we consume. And, it, and I, right. I talk about this at length, too, because I do run into people who, who like to argue that, you know, um, you can't tell me that, um, you know, grains are bad. They've been around for 10,000 years. Of course, we've, we've evolved to, to process them correctly. And, uh, you know, very few people really have problems with it. Well, if you if you look around the world and especially at, at the, the Western world where you have um, the, these uh, gigantic grocery stores and now almost instant delivery online of, you know, um, products, uh, snacks and, and things like that. None of that was available for 10,000 years. And mm -hmm. um, we certainly haven't evolved. Um, to uh, stay thin in, in light of, you know, this kind of consumption. Um, this is why, again, all over the Western world, you see uh, the weight of the average person, like going yeah. up tremendously over the past 30, 40 years. And this coincide, coincides perfectly with the rise of sort of industrialized food production, 
the ability to ship foods all around the world in refrigerated containers and to keep you know fruits and grains and things uh, on everyone's plate uh, fresh and you know delicious so um, so this is one of the reasons why uh, we're sort of in this situation where unlike just maybe a hundred or two hundred years ago, people would go through periodic famines, you know, and there yeah. wouldn't be very much on their plate. And certainly, you know, two hundred years ago, um, if you didn't live on a farm, you didn't have milk. You really had a, a much different diet um, than we have now. I see that even there... from from my grandparents to my parents. Uh, the difference mm -hmm. in you know people that lived out of their garden almost all year long, even if it was, you know, uh, they're canning their vegetables so that they could have them during the, during the winter um, versus um, sort of the, the more newer population that eat out mostly. Or if they do eat at home, you know, it's right out of the grocery store and, you know, we don't know where it's produced. We don't know, you know, how good the soil was or, you know, what kind of pesticides or anything else was put on it? There's a uh, there's a, a term in your book that you use, um, thing like uh, wealthy malnutrition to define the way we eat right now. And and yeah. this is this is an observation a lot of people have made, which is that predominantly overnutrition has become um, the standard problem of the Western world, not malnourishment and not starvation. Yeah. But this overnutrition where, um, you know, 50% or more of the population is technically obese. And um, when you get up to uh, certain ages, uh, it's, even, it's even higher. So um, we know that uh, having lots of adipose tissue, which is fat, primarily belly fat, is um, very conducive to uh, having systemic inflammation and diseases that are um, arise from um, this this condition. So, um, you know, it, it's it's not only reflected in um, how your joints work and how you feel and how much energy you have, but um, very connected to um, what kind of um, maladies you're going to have as you age from hypertension and diabetes to even how uh, a pathogen like COVID-19 affects you. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we all heard over and over since the beginning of, of this pandemic that uh, people with diabetes and obese people were at much higher risk of a bad outcome. And this is a very practical um Example, yeah. Example, exactly of yeah, yeah, um, yeah. of why keeping your 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 weight to an optimal level and and uh, not having a body that is already fighting uh, chronic inflammation simply because of your lifestyle, um, why this is going to have an impact if something like you know uh, flu virus or COVID you know comes around. Mm. Yeah. So basically, we've been evolving uh, over uh, millions of years to deal with periods of famine and uh, uh, nutritional uh, abundance. And then we invented agriculture and people started to eat more and more and more since then. And that, that process is still undergoing because uh, it's a reality. Uh, I was mentioning to you in Brazil, like because of over the last 20 years, uh, Brazil has uh, introduced uh, 60 million people into the middle class. People who uh, 20, 30 years ago they didn't, uh, they were they were malnourished. They all of a sudden had access to McDonald's, to uh, deep fried uh, food and and trans fats and all of that stuff. Actually, some historians and some uh, researchers theorize that that's uh, why, in the first place, uh, fasting was introduced in some into some cultures. Because if you see uh, the, the 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 oldest civilizations and oldest uh, religions, they all uh, have uh, fasting. Although we can think it's a way of 
uh, it was introduced as a way of uh, purifying them to be in contact with the divinity. It could also be uh, understood as a way to compensate for, for that intake because it was uh, coincidental with, with the time when uh, we became sed sed sedentarians and uh, started to eat more, right? That's exactly right. Um, so in the Middle Ages, they called men Many of the diseases that are common now, uh, gout, uh, diabetes, and obesity, those were, those were uh, referred to by physicians and writers as essentially the maladies or diseases of the wealthy. Um, but it's, it's been just in the last couple of hundred years that the general, the general public has access to the kinds and amounts of foods they were only available to the very rich. There's a, obviously a lot to be said for how um, industrialization and farming techniques and refrigeration and all these great things have helped put um, food on the table and to make it nutritious, et cetera. But, you know, there has certainly been a... Um, uh, a great focus in the last, you know, uh, 70 or 80 years on the presentation of food in a way that scientifically makes you hungry and makes you want yeah. to eat more and to get, you know, literally hooked on yeah. this type yeah. of food. And of course, now we're, we're, we're learning that, um, you know, a significant portion, like 80% of the feel good, um, uh, brain signal, uh, serotonin comes from the gut. And basically, mm. wow. um, the gut bacteria that primarily like to, like to consume things like fast carbohydrates, those are the ones that are most attuned to giving off this, um, uh, feel good, uh, well-being, uh, chemical, uh, that is responsible for giving you that good feeling. So when people talk about their comfort foods, first of all, yeah. it's almost always something that's sweet or, um, or has uh, rapidly digestible carbohydrates. This, this, has, um, this has really uh, affected people and it's important that they understand that it's not something that um, is outside their control that they, you know, they can change their, their lifestyle, um, that they can implement um, certain strategies that will allow them to eat, you know, those kind of meals part of the time, and then either uh, just restrict their calories a portion of the time or fast intermittently, uh, or, you know, have a desirable good meal every day, but only within a certain window of time. These are all different strategies that I talk about in the book, and um, each have their their benefits and downsides. You know, some of them, when you um, when you make a lesser effect, you have to do it more frequently. Um, so there's a big difference between you know somebody that that goes on a a five day or fourteen day fast um, and loses a lot of weight, and you know. Uh, essentially gets much healthier in a short period of time and somebody who um, slowly over years cuts back 10 percent 20 percent yeah uh, etc on on their calories so it's a it's a more gradual improvement but in every case it's beneficial to do these and so you really just have to learn about this understand why you can't just go completely one way or another and disregard the science because mm -hmm. i you know i have vegan friends that that basically you know would be happy having a uh, a sugary soda and a candy bar as a as a meal because you know well there's no meat or dairy in it um you know <laughs> so it's vegan it must be good yeah, right yeah um, yeah but, but obviously that's you know that's not the good aspect of or the healthy aspect, and it's the same with paleo. Um, yeah, I had a lot of friends that jumped on the paleo bandwagon and were just eating copious amounts of uh, bacon and eggs and sour cream and cheese and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. 
And I would yeah. ask them, you know, have, have you taken your cholesterol lately? Um, because, you know, for some of these people, uh, especially who have a certain genetic propensities, um, their cholesterol can absolutely skyrocket. And, it, and it's not just the, the number cholesterol itself, but it's yeah. the fact that their particle counts are doubling or yeah. tripling. That's a very important difference to, to make because um, uh, you have the count of uh, LDL and LDL particles, which is more accurate than total LDL, right? To, to, to figure out uh, the risk for, for heart disease or other, other diseases. Just lipidemia, you know, the study of this lipids in the bloodstream and the, the, the various, uh, you know, maladies that occur it's very complex and you will find um, scientists and, and clinicians who disagree among themselves. But primarily yeah. what you see is that most of the clinicians say that these lipoproteins um, are causing problems. So um, cholesterol has really become a biomarker for these lipoproteins. And so even though you can say, um, well, the cholesterol itself isn't that bad. Um, if you if you wa are walking around with um, a really high cholesterol number, 400, 500, something like that, and mm -hmm. your particle number is very high, and what you're going to see is that is that your statistical risk of having one of these events is dramatically increased. You hear from a lot of these individuals that are kind of dogmatic about um, you can eat all the meat and fat, et cetera, that you want. You can hear yeah. like, well, the problem really is sugar. And they're partially right. I mean, sugar is definitely a huge problem. And I think um, for many people, it's, it's far more of a risk than fat. But one thing about humans is that, you know, we're very heterogeneic, meaning that there's a vast difference between individual to individual. So you see genetic types that um, basically can get diabetes and uh, become obese, and yet their all-cause mm -hmm. mortality death is lower. It's a topic in the US referred to as the Hispanic paradox, you know, mm -hmm. um, because they tend to be, um, as a group, more uh, prone to diabetes and, and obesity, yeah. and yet they actually outlive um, um, Caucasians and other groups um, uh, who have no um, maladies, so to speak. So, um, you know, there's, there, is a, there is a great difference uh, person to person. And I think um, if one can afford it, the best thing to do is to uh, twice or more a year, try and get a comprehensive blood test. And, and I go through this in the book because I do think it's a, it's a really good investment in your health yeah. is to totally. have somebody you know, test you uh, for your lipids, your hormones, your, your um, white blood cell count, how your immune system is doing essentially, um, your enzyme production, to look at all these things and more and more we're getting a handle on what should be quote unquote optimal for someone right. uh, and, and then target what could you do to make those risks look better. So if, if having high homocysteine or high C-reactive protein or one of these other biomarkers is associated with a much greater risk of morbidity and mortality, then, um, then focus on really fixing that problem. And one of the things that really impressed me was regardless of the organism, whether it was yeast cells or Drosophila, little fruit flies, uh, mice or humans, uh, uh, calorie restriction and fasting have been shown in hundreds of studies to greatly improve a lot of these biomarkers. As far as What's the easiest thing for a person to do to make a fairly dramatic improvement in their health if they're not healthy? It's to adopt one of these particular lifestyle changes. 
every time people start discussing uh, this or that approach uh, for eating, people say, yeah, it's different for everyone. And even though that is true, I mean, like, uh, it's it's really important to uh, get a, a, a closer look at your at your parameters and seeing, okay, maybe I should lower my, my fat intake now since I've been on keto for two years. But at the same time, these uh, strategies can be really useful in uh, a, a addressing this this problem, which is to have this this pathway uh, on all the time, which uh, signals a lot of bad stuff for your body, and uh, and which is, is on the very birth of the onset of many diseases, from from uh, diabetes to cancer, Alzheimer, and Parkinson. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a really good start to start from one of those strategies, like uh, ketogenic, either being a ketogenic diet or caloric restriction or a time restricted feeding or an extended fasting window. I was uh, telling you the other day when we first met about my dad and uh, he, uh, he was uh, really stubborn uh, into making uh, uh, changes in his lifestyle because he was diabetic. And then I finally got to convince him through giving him uh, uh, Jason Funk's book, which is a fantastic book about about fasting, and it re completely changed his life. Every month, he takes like a, an extended 48-hour fasting, and on the other days, he uh, he eats on a uh, variable window. He's not on keto or anything. He doesn't eat more fat than he he uh, he needs to because his LDL is a little high. So uh, he fa found his his thing, you know, and he lost a lot of weight. He's he's uh, uh, off uh, metformin right now, and his doctors are really happy with him. There's lots of studies that show that um, type two diabetics can completely reverse um, yeah. that condition. Uh, can go off insulin if they were on insulin and return to a normal, healthy glucose by just adopting one of those three things, a ketogenic diet, um, calorie restriction, or, or intermittent fasting. So it's a, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a lot of problems associated with diabetes in particular. Um, so one of the effects of having glucose in your bloodstream uh, at high levels is that it glycates. Um, so that's when the the sugar molecule attaches to other proteins, and it will attach to the proteins that line your blood vessels and mm -hmm. um, essentially uh, cause hardening of the arteries. Because if you've ever seen like a creme brulee where they take a little sugar, they put it yeah. on top, and then they, yeah. they, they apply heat to it, uh, and it makes mm -hmm. a little glass-like uh, yeah. top out of the sugar, that's, that's, that's glycation. The yeah. Glycation. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you're essentially doing that to the cells that line your blood vessels and causing this hardening of the arteries. And when your body tries to pump uh, more blood through the, the vessels, um, like you're climbing up a, uh, some stairs or going for a jog or are, are just stressed out in a meeting or something, rather than those blood vessels expanding uh, when they're glycated, um, the vessels actually fracture, and then um, those fractures all become points where atherosclerosis can take place. Um, yeah. So having diabetes is a very strong predictor that you will have atherosclerosis, among any, yeah. uh, many other things. So Alzheimer's yeah. is called by many doctors and uh, referred to in medical texts, et cetera, as type 3 diabetes, because it's present uh, in almost all the same conditions as diabetes in diabetic people, meaning that it's much more prevalent in obese diabetics um, and seems to get better and worse depending on um, how bad the diabetes is. Um, so there's, a, there's just a huge correlation here, and yet um, you can completely ameliorate your type two diabetes with a, a relatively um, easy to implement um, yeah. dietary change.
Now, when I say easy, I mean, on paper, it's pretty easy to say, um, you know, I'm going to cut my calories or I'm going to um, I'm going to narrow my window of eating um, so that I, I only have six hours or eight hours a day that I have to once I'm outside that I just don't eat. Um, and it'll it'll take effort and discipline to get through that. And then after a while, it'll just be what you do and your body will get very used to it. And more and more, I've been telling people that if they want to make one of these major lifestyle changes, to first do a ketogenic diet, because I honestly think that that's the easiest one to get into. Yeah. You're not restricting yourself. You're eating as much food as you want. And initially, you could even do it with, with unhealthy fats, not for a long period of time, but if you just want to transition quickly, then you can do it by just following the normal ketogenic diet people would, will talk about. And then slowly, if you're going to keep doing it or doing it periodically, I would switch to the healthier fats, which I talk about in the book, um, monounsaturated fats and uh, omega fats, for example, and try and make it as, as uh, healthy a diet as possible, which I certainly think you can do. I, I was on a, a, a vegetarian ketogenic diet and then a vegan ketogenic diet. Uh, for about six years, I go back and forth to having uh, periods when I, uh, you know, I'll do a ketogenic diet for a, a week or two um, because I want my body to be able to quickly switch between consuming glucose for cellular energy and consuming my own fat for cellular energy. And if you get your cells uh, out of the habit of burning fat, then they'll basically just kind of wait, you know, because if, if they're essentially trained to say, well, every time my glycogen levels have gotten low, um, you know, James, James manages to come up with some carbohydrates and, and then your cells literally will hold out and not switch over to um, this fat burning state as quickly and easily uh, than if you go through a ketogenic diet where you essentially train them to do this. And the more you do yeah. this back and forth, go from a carbohydrate-rich diet to a, a, a very low-carbohydrate diet, your cells will just do it without even thinking of it. So now that I've done this for years, um, I can miss two, two meals in a row. You know, I don't do breakfast ever, so I just have coffee in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. take some supplements and that sort of thing. And then I usually have my first meal around noon. Uh, and um, I don't tend to eat um, past three or four o'clock. Uh, so I, I have a fairly short eating window of, you know, window, yeah. uh, like four hours at the most generally. Um, if, I, if I'm busy, uh, I'm traveling or I'm, I'm in the lab doing something, um, I can just completely forget about food entirely and, you know, it'll be six, seven o'clock at night and I'll realize, well, I didn't have lunch. And I'll mm -hmm. think, well, you know, I might as well just make this a fasting day. You know, I'll, I'll let, I'll mm -hmm. let my body, you know, um, consume my own fat overnight. And then, you know, tomorrow at noon, I'll have mm -hmm. my, my whole meal. And sometimes I plan it. Sometimes it's just, you know, um, uh, the way it happens. But um, I don't get any kind of hunger pains. I don't think about it because my cells have just automatically switched. They're mm -hmm. like, okay, dose is low. Like we're going to switch to fat burning. You know, there's I never I never feel fatigued. I don't uh, I don't have a loss of energy or or mental concentration. Um, you know that I would have had in the old days of where I was just you know consuming high carbohydrates all the time. Um, so I think it's a very advantageous state to be in. I'm 65 years old and I just had one of the best, um, uh, comprehensive blood tests in my life. Um, so, uh, I know that the strategies, um, for me personally work, uh, so it's not just hypothetical. I've seen it in lots of, uh, friends and people I've advised. Um, and of course the scientific literature is just incontrovertible that um, 
uh, not even just in humans, but, but in almost every species that's ever been tried in, calorie restriction and intermittent fasting like really rejuvenates um, elderly bodies. Yeah. Do, do you ever uh, extend your, your fasting uh, for more than 20 hours, like a three-day fast or five-day, seven-day fast? So I personally haven't gone longer than three days. I've, I've done that uh, uh, several times, like three or four times. And um, I, I do uh, 48-hour uh, intermittent fasting kind of combo uh, quite often. It's really easy for me to do since I only eat between 12 o'clock and four o'clock. Um, okay. I'll have yeah. I'll have a meal on Saturday at noon, and then I won't have another meal till Monday. And since I I'm only used to eating one meal a day at noon, I'm really technically only feel like I'm missing one meal. I don't have a meal on Sunday, and mm -hmm. yet from noon on Saturday till noon on on Monday is a 48 hour period I went without food. So I'm able, yeah. able to really turn on fat burning and you know autophagy every single weekend that I do that, which is which is fairly often because like I said, I don't even feel it. You know, because yeah. my my cells just turn uh from one mechanism to another so quickly and you know, it doesn't doesn't uh, send any signals sort of saying like, hey, we're starving, you know, please feed us, um, mm. uh, you know, that you would get, you know, if you were if you were addicted to carbohydrate. Essentially, that's what that's what happens to cells that never go through any sort of, you know, loss of loss of uh, carbohydrates. Yeah. So, um, James, we still have a lot to cover. And uh, what about, I don't know, if, if we take uh, like a five-minute break and start and, and record another episode, do you are st still up for it? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah? I'm doing okay. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's fantastic then. Uh, so uh, we will take it from here and uh, discuss, for example, uh, strategies for extended fasting like uh, electrolytes, uric acid, spikes, uh, other things to, to watch out for, and also the beneficial effects of fasting that you've uh, seen through our studies, what it actually did on humans for life extension, because some people still uh, are skeptical and they claim that, okay, uh, caloric restriction only works for mice and, and monkeys, so we uh, could address that. And, and also some other stuff like uh, the cool toys that you have in your, in your lab and life extension and other subjects. So uh, we'll talk back again in a few minutes, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. All right, man. Thank you and see okay. you in a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a Rádio Vive Agora foi criada e apresentada por Matheus Potumati. A direção de arte e a edição de vídeo é minha, Marina Tavares. A produção de áudio e de luz é do Gustavo Potumati. E a trilha sonora é do DJ Roger. O programa tem caráter exclusivamente informativo. E as afirmações feitas aqui não constituem a prática de medicina ou de qualquer outra disciplina da saúde. Recomendamos cautela com o uso de informações e produtos divulgados aqui. E não nos responsabilizamos por eventuais efeitos adversos decorridos dos mesmos. As opiniões expressas pelos convidados são de sua responsabilidade exclusiva e nós não advogamos ou garantimos suas qualificações ou credibilidade. O programa pode conter apoios pagos por anúncios de produtos e serviços. As pessoas presentes nesse programa podem ter interesse financeiro direto ou indireto em produtos citados aqui. Se você acha que possui algum problema de saúde, consulte o um profissional especializado.